All right, we'll have Coach Mendenhall open with uh, some comments, and then we'll go to questions. Yeah, um, really, really like the way my team played uh, this past week. I thought they competed hard. I thought they played physical. I thought they just um, are becoming um, what I expect and how I expect uh, a, a good football team and a physical football team and a competitive football team to play every week. Um, as the standards keep raising, the expectations from me to them also keep raising. We do expect to win. We're always disappointed and frustrated if we don't. Um, and that's becoming um, clear that uh, it's, it's not OK because we expect to win. And especially when we have uh, a huge influence on outcome, we made too many mistakes in that game. Even though it wasn't a significant amount, the mistakes were significant enough. Uh, especially in the special teams. Um, so we have to get those corrected um, in order to uh, uh, not have those put us at risk again for games that come right down to the end, um, which as the ACC um, opponents and those games usually do to win, they're very competitive, especially on the road. And so, uh, but I, I did like uh, the way we played and I was encouraged really, um, especially uh, defensively first, offensively second, and and then special teams with room to improve, certainly. Looking forward to our next game um, and uh, uh, our matchup versus Virginia Tech and anxious uh, for all the preparation um, that comes with it uh, and, and the urgency that comes with it, especially playing on Friday and not a Friday night game, but a Friday afternoon game. Um, so that accelerates the timing and the urgency even though um, a rivalry game normally does that anyway, so this just adds a little bit more to it, um, which is it's, uh, it's always exciting to have an occasion to rise to, something that's meaningful to play for at the end of the year, um, and, and in this case, uh, for our program. So I'll be glad to take questions. I believe you had three down linemen in on defense for almost every play, if not every play. Will you have more flexibility this week as far as using nickel and sub packages? Yeah, there, there'll be more flexibility just um, because Virginia Tech is more multiple. And so like we've been doing um, really from for the entire season, uh, once uh, Richard Burney went down and certainly when Mandy Alonzo went down, um, but really core philosophically, we, we look to match and put our best 11 players on the field versus what our opponent does every single down. And so uh, because of what Virginia Tech does, that will they're more diverse than Georgia Tech was, which usually will lead to more diverse, a more diverse approach defensively than um, a team that just keeps the same personnel on the field. I don't want to get bogged down in this, but the decision to let the players not speak this week, you're at a point where interest in the program is kind of at an all-time high and building. What was behind kind of shutting that off? Yeah, um, in my team meeting this morning, uh, there's urgency uh, to advancing our program. There's urgency to this preparation. Um, and I certainly knew that uh, it wouldn't be widely, or it wouldn't be mo everyone's most popular decision. Um, but I did frame to him what we need to get done and what time frame and what urgency and that uh, normal um, isn't isn't enough, and we needed every second. Um, and so I told them I'd be glad to speak because uh, it's part of my job to represent the program. And I and I basically said everything that they're doing that's not involved in going to class or or winning this game is is actually not going to help us. And so I did give them a choice, um, and I think it gives our team um, the best chance to be focused, prepared and ready um, uh, to play the way they'll need to play in a very difficult environment against uh, a good team. It, it sort of follows suit with, you've approached this game differently, obviously, than past coaches, not saying it's just another game. Um, why do you think that mentality will yield a different result? Well, um, whether it yields a different result or not, we will certainly find out over time. Um, but I think I'm just stating the obvious. It's not just another game. Um, Virginia hasn't won the game in a significant amount of time. It's an in-state rival game. It's hard to take over a conference until you um, take over your own state, um, and certainly then your side of the division. And so to say it's just another game, 
I think we all realize the implications of it aren't just normal implications. They're at a higher level. Um, so I think, again, my approach has always been just to state the brutal facts. <laughs> and um, This game is more important to Virginia in terms of our regrowth um, and development and recapturing uh, an exceptional college football team than a normal game. Could you talk a little bit about Dylan Thompson's journey and specifically, I guess, the last month? Yeah, um, how much time do you have? <laughs> um, so Dylan went, anytime we consider a graduate transfer, there's a couple of core principles that are in place. We will only consider them if they'll um, get their master's degree and if they are at a position of need where they could be an immediate starter and, and have an immediate impact. Um, we thought Dylan would do that. Um, upon arrival, uh, his eventual arrival after taking extra time to qualify academically to arrive, by the time he arrived a large amount of preparation was already done. Entire training camp was missed if I remember right. And you know our program's not easy. Um, we work really hard and we have very high expectations and physical conditioning and mental toughness and the demand daily is, is it a premium? And Dylan arrived missing all of that. Um, even though he had been at Ohio State, he'd been injured. And uh, he spent the, the better part of, he's, he has spent the better part of his time here um, just gasping for air and trying to get enough oxygen and with trainers and just trying to make it through practice. And the last couple of weeks, he has started to make it through practice. <laughs> that just means from beginning to end. And with that, he's qualified for repetition. And with the repetition, he's been able to demonstrate his ability. And with demonstrated ability and now increased need, that's all kind of came together last week, which was week 11, um, just in time. And he played well. Uh, and he tried hard. And I was really proud of him, not only for sticking uh, to it, but through it. Um, because, yeah, he's a fifth-year player coming from a program of prestige, um, coming in an, under circumstances that um, we expected more and he expected more, and it was just the opposite until Saturday. And that was, I think, how we all would have hoped it had started, um, but better late than never. And it actually is, is more impactful now that he's finally reached that, knowing how difficult the transition has been for him and I was really happy for him. And um, he's just handled himself really well. Um, he's worked hard. He's been humble. He's learned. And, and he's, I think he's embraced and, and likes what he's doing and where he is. Could he possibly play next year? Not that I know of. I, I, I don't think there's an additional year um, that is available. I think we did look into that, um, but received a, a response that was, that was not possible. Um, so I think this is his only year. So he'll have the, the upcoming game against Virginia Tech and then our bowl game. Um, but again, I'm so glad that he's here. And, and without, without his ability and his work ethic and his transition, um, it would have been very hard to function last week. And not only did he play, he played really well. And I, I think led a strong defensive performance. And in terms of his grades and, grades and production, he was one of our best front seven players. Um, I have two questions. One, uh, can you give us an injury update on uh, Bryce and Joey, anybody else? From what I know today, which um, is it changes during the week, uh, I've been told that Joey will be able to practice tonight. Um, and I don't know what that'll look like. I don't think anyone does, but it will give that a shot. Um, and Bryce basically reported he felt better than he expected to. Um, today. I don't know what that means either. <laughs> so uh, you now know what I know. And the other thing was, uh, can you just talk about a little bit about uh, Alamede's progress through the year and, and uh, just the year that he's had? Alamede is um, uh, only second, I would say, to Bryce. And as he goes, we go as a football team. And in terms of scoring and production, and the more touches Alamede gets, the better chance we have to win the game. Uh, same with Bryce. And now that uh, Joe Reed is emerging, that's even better. So um, we, we've made a specific effort 
for Alameda to get the ball. Uh, certainly we haven't hit the mark every game, and um, that's as much our fault as a staff uh, as as him not being on that game, or sometimes defenses just do a little bit more to eliminate touches to him, and there's been some of that. But his consistency, his leadership, um, but more importantly, production, um, that's really been impactful. So um, I, the players get tired of me hearing about it, but I talk about consistency and durability and production. And Alamade has become more of all of those things. He's more consistent and he's more durable and he's more productive than he's ever been. And that has a lot to do with the kind of football we're playing and the progress our team is making. Coach, this is the first time since I believe 1992 that Virginia will go into this, in this Tech game with a better record than the Hokies. What have you seen from them on film and what's different about this Virginia Tech team than maybe the ones you prepared for the past two years? Um, not much, to, to be honest. Um, and from my lenses now, I get to see all phases and spend a lot of time. And again, I um, everyone has battled injuries, and they they are no different. They've had some critical injuries at critical spots, um, but man, they're well coached and they play hard. And um, I think their schedule has been tough. Um, you know, sometimes it works out that way where your crossover game or some of your non-conference games are a little bit more challenging. And I said that to uh, Pat Narduzzi before we played. Their record, I don't think, was great at that time. Um, but I acknowledged who they had played. I, I knew that. And so sometimes, you know, in game six or seven, it's still not clear by record. Um, and that's why, you know, you play an entire 12 games. So I think they've had a challenging schedule. I think that they've had a few key injuries. Um, but uh, their coaches and their schemes and their and their culture, I think, is strong. And so uh, any differences would be, again, because of uh, probably injury uh, more than anything else. Bronco back here. You're, you're now your third year into this this rivalry. Now that you have a pretty good feel for it, how how does this rivalry compare to BYU Utah when you were there? And how does your I guess your preparation, the plan, the approach you're taking to it compare to the way you approach that game? Uh, I, they're, they're distinct and different. Um, I, I don't have words to describe the BYU-Utah one because faith is, is mixed into that, and that, much like politics, brings out a whole different thing. Um, but I'm very clear how important this game is to um, our university, our fans, and our players. And, um, yeah, I've learned. Um, as all rivalry games and as just taking over any job, it becomes clearer what's really important and, and how you might need to go about something to give your team the best chance for results. And um, we have a significant deficit to overcome when you look at history. However, this is 18's team versus 18's team, and that's our focus. Uh, and so, yeah, I've acknowledged the past with our team, um, certainly with our fans, and and I am very clear of how important this game is to them. Um, all entities, including administration and leadership of the institution. And again, I think it's disproportionately more valuable than any other game at this point in UVA's football program. And so, yeah, it's not just another game. Um, it has more value. It has a bigger chance to impact our program, to generate momentum, and to continue building and doing things that haven't been done for a while. And those things have to be done to make progress. And so this is just one of the next things we um, we have to do uh, and targeted it a while ago, um, knowing just objectively, um, and it's not personal, but it is objective, this program for Virginia, or this game for the University of Virginia is more meaningful than any other game. And that's, um, that's the way we're approaching it. Coach, as a follow-up to what Brad was asking, it it's been quite some time in this rivalry that Virginia would be favored to, to win the football game. And you said 18's team versus. You've identified it as a goal to defeat them, but now your team, you could argue is playing better, has the better record. People prognosticating would look at you all as, as favored to win the game. Does that does what you're chasing mitigate that whole trap of overconfidence, so to speak? Yeah, I, uh, there's no chance we'll be overconfident. Um, there's so much work to do in our program and the things we have to correct. 
Um, and since when, well, as you probably already know, I don't listen or look as to who's favored or not, and I encourage my team not to do the same. And that doesn't mean uh, we're perfect and doesn't mean that some don't. Um, but the more that we look, the more we're influenced. The more we're influenced, the more it changes our mindset. And the more it changes our mindset, the farther it gets from where it needs to be. So I just frame that to the guys. And usually through maturity, it brings us back to just the work. And if I feel it drifting, practice just gets really hard. So it will bring them back um, purposefully. Um, who's favored or not means nothing to me. I mean, we have a really good opponent to play in the ACC, on the road, in a rivalry setting, and that alone is uh, challenging enough. As you mentioned, uh, the first Friday night game, or first Friday game was a night game, 7.30. This one's 3.30. The preceding game that Saturday was a noon game against Carolina, and you were at home. You're on the road for a 3.30 game. Didn't get back till 10.30 or so. How has that, and moreover, you have Thanksgiving in the middle of this week. Yeah. How has that changed the coaches' preparation it, schedule? It's, um, it's challenging. And, and again, I don't expect anyone, certainly um, from the media perspective, to agree that did have a lot to do with what I chose to do with the players um, because of that. And it's not just another, another early game. Thanksgiving is right in the middle. Plus, it's away versus, I mean, the circumstances are different, and we need every second we can get. And again, I don't expect it to be agreed with or applauded. Um, my job is to help our team get ready. And that's what I chose to do, um, matter of factly. Um, and so, yeah, the coaches, um, as you know, we don't work on Sunday. Um, and uh, so the, the, the impetus to then um, try to hold that principle, but then also make sure the team is ready. Um, so. Yeah, there was church times at this time, and we were working around church for probably the first time um, in one of the times that I've been the head coach, just simply because of all those things you just mentioned. So it didn't, it wasn't in the place of. Um, we just tried to make everything coexist for one day in a setting that jammed everything together and changed our schedule a little tighter. Yeah, Wednesday evening, um, the players. Uh, are going to, if any family members come into town, the players have a chance to eat Thanksgiving with their families Wednesday night um, or go to the coaches' houses to have Thanksgiving dinner, which uh, most are doing. Um, that's after a full day of work. So we'll work all day Wednesday playing, practicing, meeting. But then the evening, um, there's about a three-hour window there where everyone will be able to enjoy for a few seems like moments but a few hours Thanksgiving and then it, the foot will flip right back <laughs> to the day before the game which is Thursday and we're traveling and so it's just one other unique challenge to manage um, and uh, maybe adds to the intrigue and the test of what it takes to get ready for this game in terms of it, it's not a normal game because it's not the, the the timing is more restricted throw Thanksgiving right in the center of it <laughs> and then make it a day earlier and not only a night game but a day game and so yeah there's there's a lot going on yes mm -hmm. so wednesday the players do not have class at least here uh when you look at the progress your running game has made from a year ago to where it is now I mean, how much does that do for you confidence wise entering a game with which as you said is not like most games which has so much to do with the future of the program yeah, it, it adds stability. It's really difficult to manage a game um, if if you can't run the football when you want to. And I'm still not satisfied how we're running it um, and its efficiency and its physicality and its effectiveness. Um, what we are doing well is Bryce's ability at the quarterback position to run the ball and scramble. That's been a huge boost in our yardage. The traditional run game, um, is still a work in progress, and I'm not satisfied where that currently is. But when you put those two things together, that's give us, giving us, has given us another element that makes it more difficult for us to defend. And um, that's been fairly consistent um, throughout the entire season. Um, the games that it has not been, we haven't won. The games that it has been, we have. Flip it the other way, the games we've defended the run well, we've mostly run won, and the ones we haven't, we've mostly lost, with the exception of last week. On both on both cases. 
got two questions, Coach. Uh, first, I'd like to go back to last week for a second. Um, fourth quarter, uh, you guys are down 24-21. You guys drive to the Georgia Tech 13. You're facing a third and one. Bryce goes for a throw, tries to throw a touchdown instead of going for that first down. Was that the called play, or was that a check by yeah. Bryce there? Uh, uh, called play. Sometimes uh, we, as a staff, um, try to um, be unpredictable, and and we wanted to be aggressive. Um, so we'd already made the decision at in the fourth quarter at any time as the game wound down, if we scored a touchdown and the touchdown was tied, we were going to go for two. Um, that that was already part of our plan, and so cons keeping consistent with that. Again, winning on the road is harder than winning at home, but um, yeah, we chose to take a shot and thought we might be able to catch them playing short yardage defense. And luckily for them, they weren't, and, and unlucky for us. And you've talked a lot about how different this team is, how different the culture is. Given how competitive last year's game against Tech was, given how Tech seems to be down a little bit, is, th is there any different feel going into this game in the locker room than in the past years? No, there's, there's no difference. Um, we want to win. Um, and that, that doesn't, isn't just this game, it's every game. That's part of our standard. And uh, I was hurt and, and um, devastated. That's too strong a word, disappointed that we lost the last game, so are our players. It's noticeable now when I walk into the team meetings. First of all, when I walk into the locker room after the game, if we haven't won, it's noticeably different um, because the expectation is different. They they go in expecting to win the game, and and then it hurts longer more, and I see it Monday when I come into the team meeting. And so um, this is, uh, yeah. The, the best way to recover from being disappointed is to get right back to work and then have success. And so that just adds one more thing that makes this game important. Grant Mish will be one of the beneficiaries of, of the new rule. You're able to play him this year and he'll retain the year of eligibility. He makes his debut in game 11 and not only plays but starts. Had, had he been kind of moving toward that? Had you been thinking about playing him earlier? Or was no. it just because of the option? It was, um, again, our, our need for a additional D-lineman, and we, we called him up to practice with um, our travel team. And next thing we know, man, he's playing really well, and he's doing a nice job. And he's, he's a first year, and he's skinny, and he doesn't look like he belongs in there yet but he just kept practicing relentlessly and hard and physical and doing the right things and became trustworthy. And uh, yeah, by the time it got to Thursday, it was, okay, who's done the best job this week? And it wasn't the season this week. And he, he had outperformed um, some of um, our other defensive linemen to earn the chance to start. He did not play as much as some of the other D linemen once the game got going, um, but it's a huge compliment that he earned that coming literally from the preparation team and the team that's looking to, to help the opponent and then <laughs> starting against Georgia Tech and the option, he had a great week of practice. Um, Tommy Christ ended up, once the game started, doing a really nice job and so the volume of plays kind of shifted um, and then Aaron Famui was mixed in as it went. Um, so Dylan Thompson, we didn't have any idea how well and consistent he would play, but he did so he kept playing. Um, uh, Grant earned the start, then it was taken over by Tommy, and then Aaron was supplemented as needed is how it ended up playing out. Again, I'd love to guess during practice and identify exactly how the game will be, um, but um, it was uh, just lucky that, uh, that Coach Soto had those guys prepared to the level they were so we could play that many, and, and they played well. They really did. Coach, from what you can gather, have the veteran players like Awan Thornhill shared with Bryce Perkins, some of the younger guys, how big of a deal this rivalry is, and do you hope that they have done that? You know, one of the one of the things by um, making it such a clear objective so long ago, um, meaning coming out of last season and going through the summer, is that that education and onboarding and orientation has been happening. It's already done, so it's not not it's not, not not now all of a sudden. Oh, it's Virginia Tech, and now this is what that's like. Th this started, and by design, a long time ago. So all that's been done. Um, so there's nothing new in terms of messaging from player to player, um, or from coach to player. 
that wasn't started a long time ago. And I learned um, just now after um, becoming more familiar um, with the University of Virginia, uh, with this rivalry and this circumstance, and, and hopefully uh, we've addressed it and I've addressed it the most appropriate way for our team to have their best chance um, to play the kind of football they can. And, and part of that is not now having to recalibrate and have some new messaging that um, is just one other thing to add to a short week anyway. To follow up, Bryce visited for the UVA Tech game. Um, mm, I'd forgotten that. Well, then you might not have a great answer to this question. Yeah. I was going to ask did, if I was going to say, did he? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, I'll use that. No, I, I was going to ask if that's something that had an impression on him in terms of the rivalry, if anything stood out. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't say. I didn't, I didn't remember that that's when he came. So, yeah. And then my other one was, you said, uh, and Kelly also did, that Tim Harris had been playing his best football. How did he play at Georgia Tech? Are we still on the same yeah, arc? Yeah, he's done a really, really nice job. And um, he's physical, and he's consistent, and he's durable, and he's tough. And yeah, it's uh, it might be my favorite story of the year to this point. Um, I'm really, really proud of him. Um, on who he's becoming and how he's just battled. Um, and uh, it's gratifying as a coach to see um, just growth and progress. What's your best case scenario for Brennan Armstrong at this point? Oh, man, that, um, that we don't have to count this year as one of his years, that starts it and then Every time we put him in, he scores touchdowns. <laughs> if we do have to put him in, <laughs> I really like him. And uh, he's Bryce's heir apparent currently. And um, one of the biggest takeaways from the season is we have a really good quarterback behind uh, Bryce. I'm, I'm a fan because, again, I watch him every day against the defense. And they have a hard time stopping him. And he thinks he can make every play. And his pulse might have got to, like, 42 in that game when he went in. I mean, he just threw it like it was practice, and um, it's pretty cool. Well, yeah, every chance, every anything that I can do in terms of managing to not have this year count is what we'll do with him. He's at three. So, uh, Coach, you mentioned uh, Tech's tough schedule, but you guys have played a couple similar opponents. Pitt and Georgia Tech notably and not giving up the same kind of gaudy numbers defensively yeah. without giving up too much game plan or, or anything like that. What have you seen on film from Tech that's not working defensively? Oh, I, I First of all, they they have a, an exceptional coach that's leading their, their defensive side who's had years and years of success, and I think their players try hard. Um, I, um, the only thing I could say is that um, there's been uh, struggles with consistency and that sometimes has given up uh, big plays or points, and then in between it looks like Tech's defense again. And so consistency is, is probably the, the thing that's been um, a difference, if I've seen one, um, not capability. I'm pretty sure that on this day last year, neither Brennan nor Bryce had committed to the program. I know you had been recruiting both and were involved, but at that point, Lindell was the only quarterback who was a lock to be in the program in, in 2018. Do you ever think about how fortunate you are and the program is, the way things worked out on that front? You know, I, 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 I uh, think back to Holly and I living in the RV on our, um, <laughs> on our property, and I think about our first year winning two games. Um, I think about things like that all the time. And um, it, it adds perspective, but it doesn't change urgency. And so a lot has been accomplished, I would argue, in a, in a fairly short amount of time um, in a framework that's adding a really solid foundation and format for consistency and sustainability um, with um, two great opportunities to add to what's already been done this year. And so if you start to think about what if, there's, there's two pretty big what ifs for this team um, uh, for them to, to chase and strive for and reach for, and I would love to help them. Mm. 
coached specifically to the game and, and appealing to that that old defensive coordinator in you, even though you oversee the, the whole operation, specifically to what you've seen from Ryan Willis and, and Tech offensively that, that mm. concerns you and that you'll need to address? Well, so um, I think uh, yeah, Justin, or Coach Fuente, does a really nice job um, going all the way back to the TCU days. And they just, um, their, their scheme, their use of the field and personnel and, and design is really, I, I think is really strong. And what they've done is they've, uh, with their quarterback now, they're highlighting what his skill set is with still maintaining as much of the existing identity as possible of what they've always done and what they've done really well. And so to their credit, they're, they've tailored it to uh, get the most out of the player they have at quarterback within their design. And, and so, yeah, I'm impressed. But I always have been with just um, how they've um, operated offensively and, and the production they've had. Coach, you're in the back. You mentioned the differences in the BYU-Utah rivalry and this rivalry with Tech, but are there some similarities for you personally in regards to embrace having the players embrace the rivalry and the importance of it and not kind of, <coughs> excuse me, being shielded from just having it being a normal game, so to speak? Yeah, I, I think I've been really clear uh, and fairly outspoken going into the third year of how important the game is. And so that simple stance, I don't think shields anybody it's made it clear to anyone that's been around our program that the game is more impactful, it is more important, it will do more for our program, it will generate more momentum, and, and, it's, uh, and it's significant. And so the, my message is doesn't really change who and whom I'm sharing it with. So, man, if any of our players feel differently than that, they haven't been listening and they're probably not in the right team meeting room. Take our last two questions from Mike and Doug. Obviously, you want Bryce to stay healthy and not take big hits. But um, what was your reaction when you saw him get dinged up in the last one? And how uh, there's a difference between hurting and being injured. How physically tough has he been this season? Oh man, he, he's he's um, he's fiercely resilient and he's very tough. And when he went down, it was a combination of all kinds of things. It was we just given up a safety. Um, there goes our quarterback. Um, and then right after that, we give up a, a free kick for a touchdown. So I, I don't know what circumstance in college football in a three-play stretch is, or two-play stretch is like worse than that, but that's pretty high up there on the scale. Um, but then to hear later that, um, um, that he might return, I was like, how, how can that be? And there, there are, there's a fairly common practice sometimes once an x-ray is made if it's not a fracture or not a break and and pain and there's no there's not a significant or more risk to injury being done then sometimes players uh, have pain medicine that allow them to to fight through it which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't sometimes they're effective and sometimes not but to see Bryce play the way he continued to play when he came back I, I certainly didn't expect that He just has been, normally when you have a dynamic player at quarterback that runs and is so athletic, the chance that he remains healthy and, and not affected week in and week out for the number of plays, either contact or, or hits or just simple volume of what it takes to manage practice and games, they're normally not as consistent. And he's been just the opposite, where you basically see the same Bryce Perkins and our same quarterback every single game, which it's really been helpful to our team as um, as they learn and grow. Along those lines, in a succession of interviews last week, Paul Johnson raved about Bryce like he never raves about anybody. Did he say anything to you about Bryce before or after the game? You know, he didn't. Uh, normally, Paul and I, we visit uh, quite a bit before the game, but uh, Robert and I has worked with Paul and worked for him for a long time, and so they were having kind of a, a sit down before the game. So I just walked by and and made uh, I, I teased Robert in front of Paul and asked him to get him straight for me and um, let him laugh, and I just kept walking. So the time that where that would have been available um, didn't happen for this game, and then afterwards, with the way the game finished, um, 
I really wasn't in one of those chatty moods, so there really wasn't a chance after. All right, thank well, thanks. Well, thank you.